What is up, Watch Fam? I am Christian from Theo and Harris. And I'm Anna from Theo and Harris. And today we're going to be trying something new. I'm going to talk about some watch news and other watch things. What? So. I don't know. Let's do it. Okay, we have a pretty complete schedule. We're talking about a new Hodinkee release. We're talking about uh, Gavril Tribeca. We're talking about uh, Grand Seiko. We're talking about new straps. And I think Hublot. I'm missing something. And Hublot. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're Hublot. Uh, but before we do that, what are you wearing on your wrist? I'm wearing my pull router, my Universal Genève pull router. She was in service for most of <laughs> quarantine <laughs> for yeah. several months, I, but uh, yeah. but now I have her again, and it's, it's service summer. Servicing watches was difficult in the beginning of COVID because yeah. uh, figuring out like what people were doing. I mean, when I say people, I mean like watchmakers and different you know parts suppliers. It's difficult. So a couple months in, people figured it out what they were doing. But for a while there, and Anna, you know, for a while that no one knew, and Anna's watch was the victim of that. It was in limbo for literally three months. Um, I do apologize about that. Uh, Theo and Harris Service Center still now up and running. Yeah, Theo and Harris Service Center now up and running. Um, I'm wearing a vintage uh, Jaeger LeCoultre. Um, Jaeger LeCoultre. That's a new. That's a new pronunciation. Je, 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 <laughs> Catalog that. Je, je, je l'écoute. Um, yeah, vintage watch from 1940s, really, really beautiful. These watches are known as officer's watches. Um, they, they weren't actually, you know, military issued, but that was kind of the uh, that was that was the kind of uh, style and function of the era. Kind of, uh, it, it was a sports watch. Officers did wear them, uh, but they were not mil spec or mil issue. They're just uh, they're just really cool pieces. I actually yeah, owned really cool. one of these years ago. I don't know if you remember that. Very similar looking to that one. Mine had a sub second, mm -hmm. and I regret selling that watch constantly. Beautiful watch. It was actually my first, apart from my, it was actually the first watch that I had bought with Theo and Harris money. Yeah, it, it was one of the like yeah. first ones in like as you started collecting. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I regret yeah. selling it uh, like hugely. It was a really big mistake. Um, but Whoever hey, what are you gonna do? It. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's get into the first conversation. What do we have first? Yeah. Up? Okay. So Hublot um, recently released a, a a watch that they're calling a, a gender neutral watch. Yeah. Um, it is this pink color. And it's basically just a big bang in pink mm -hmm. that they're calling gender neutral. Well, it's was it millennium or millennial pink? Yeah. So so uh, upon first look, yeah, I said this is ridiculous because first of all, in my opinion, I think uh, a majority of people's opinions, yeah. you know, watches are gender neutral because we're not assigning uh, genders to watches anymore. We don't. We don't. Like, well, brands still do that technically, but. Um, People pretty much feel free to wear whatever they want. Yeah. And uh, one of the main reasons they're calling this watch gender neutral is because of this pink color, mm. which is called millennial pink. Mm. And I didn't know that. I've never heard of millennial pink before. So I started reading about it. And there are a few articles that <laughs> that say, okay, this is millennial pink. This is the color of now. It reminds me of, this is totally inappropriate. <laughs> and and it, it does remind me of Reservoir Dogs. Like okay. I was going to say, why do we get pink? Why, why is millennial, you know? I just don't understand why I have to be pink. It's the white. It's the blonde. It's the blue. It's the orange. Mr. Pink. Why am I Mr. Pink? <laughs> Again, Things I was reading are, are from like three years ago. Right, like this is the color that's in. This is this that. gender neutral color from yeah. three years ago. So, so it's kind of already you're validated yourself, and and this conversation already is like, okay, why? What? Listen, Hublot <laughs> will make a special edition for anything. You know, Hublot has made millions, but like not millions. It made, yeah. Hublot is almost single handedly responsible for <laughs> making limited editions not cool anymore. They're not limited when when everything not is special li anymore. When everything is limited, nothing is limited. Period. End. Hublot would make a sure. limited edition for a high school Long Island lacrosse team if they were commissioned. If they had a three-piece commitment, you know, that's Hublot. that's <laughs> Hublot's like bar for mm -hmm. what will I do a special you know, edition? This whole idea of, of a general neutral watch, I think, is ridiculous. I would say that almost every watch that is popular. Mm -hmm. Right now, obviously, taking out of the equation, you know, uh, Omega's little um, constellations or, or, or Deville's, like these yes, little little right. watches. Those aren't popular watches. Omega, I'm talking about every popular yeah. watch you find is could uh, could just as easily be worn by a woman as it could be by a man, and often right? are. Like a, you know, a lot yes. of them are. Right. Uh, this idea of you know what is masculine is is uh, it, it's it's so cultural, and because yeah. the world is so much smaller now, we have which is a uh, much more kind of um, uh, full look, you know, uh, back, you know, in the early 1920s, a, a, a man's watch was a very small, you know, dress watch, mm -hmm. right? Fast forward to the 2000s and Breitling for Bentley was a man's watch. Mm -hmm. Now we're somewhere in the middle. 
Now we're somewhere where we say, oh, that's that's you know that's a gentleman, and that's that could be a gentleman. But but both yeah. both are men's watches. Mm -hmm. um, we're not we're not so uh, kind of obtuse anymore. Yes. and that's a great thing. I, I think that's terrific. I, you know, I, I think it's great that you know uh, we can be a little bit more creative and selective, a little bit more personal in our style. We're not being pigeonholed by you know whoever tells us what is what is masculine. Which I'm, I dig that. Yeah, absolutely. The idea of a gender neutral watch. It's it's it's, it's, it's um. It's it's pandering. It, it, it's <laughs> yeah. pandering to me. It's so reductive. Yes. Uh, Hugh Blow, get the fuck out of here. And doesn't it a little it's bit stupid make your other lines of watches look look like? Okay, so then are you saying those are not? Because now there's this one that's for yeah. I suppose uh, yes. I suppose uh, that know. if there if there's one watch that is gender neutral, it would imply that the rest of them are not gender neutral. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I think Which is it's, a strange opinion to want to make about. It's Your watches. Weird. It's it's weird. It's yeah. weird. Where whatever you want. <laughs> I, like, it's something we on liquor on last week. Someone asked, you know, and this is a very similar question. Um, can a guy with tattoos wear a Cartier? Of course. It's, fan it's such a cool. That's look. awesome. The whole idea is Please personal do. taste. <laughs> That's the whole idea. Like if, if you're if you're lucky enough in your life to develop an informed and personal taste, you are, in my opinion, one of the most lu you know, lucky people uh, right. because you have to explore yourself and you know what, what is your style. What what exp you know what is an expression of you. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing feeling. It's an am and so many people never have that, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm lucky to have found a lot of that in the last few years because I'm yes. so passionate about clothing. Uh, and and once you finally feel comfortable in your own clothing, um, and it's not just about self confidence. It's about like it really is about exploring what else is out there. Mm -hmm. um, it's an amazing feeling. So so yeah, wear, wear whatever you want. Stu <laughs> stupid Hugh Blow, shame shame. Okay, so the next thing we wanted to talk about is Hodinky, and this is yeah. news that just. But you no, know, broke today. Hit the wire. Hit, hit the whole wire. <laughs> so they, uh, Hodinkee just announced a new release, um, and it is an eight-day uh, travel. Travel you? clock alarm. Travel clock alarm. Great. Yeah, it's a uh, stupid watch. What's your... No, no. Listen, I I, I, I love Hodinkee. Yeah, in, in the watch industry, it's always sure. in, in any you know. In, turn on the news. You know, it's so cool to hate the successful person. Right? It is. It's yeah. so easy to, to hate Hodinkee, right? And so much of that is, is out of jealousy, right? right. Uh, I, I, have, I have none of that. I'm not to say I'm not jealous. I, you, know, you also owe a lot envious, of... Envious, definitely. I, I admire Hodinkee, of course. Um, but, but I don't uh, use jealousy and, and, or, 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 or admiration and turn it into something that's poisonous. I look mm -hmm. at it as, well, it's really informative. How, what can we learn from that? Sure. So many people are so insecure. They're so angry. They hate, you know, they hate people. They're just ridiculous. It's mm -hmm. childish. Um, uh, um, but I don't like the product. It's, I think it's a stupid product. It, you know, let, let's let's talk about it. So Hodinkee, yeah. you know, tra travel alarm, you know, travel clocks, also alarms, um, were very very popular in the 20th century. Um, uh, rather comparably to today. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Uh, um, JLC made them. Movado made them. Elgin made them. So everyone made these little neat. Um, kind of, many of them were leather accented, leather wrapped um, mm -hmm. clocks. I've owned them. We've sold them. Yeah, they're very cool. Fantastic little things. But they're Super cool neat. as like desk accessories. It's an accoutrement. Or accoutrement. Yeah, watch, sure. You know? I'm not going to carry this in my pocket because right. I have a wristwatch. Right. You know, well, no, well, primarily. Well, they're not telling you to carry it in your pocket. What they're saying is, you know, you can put it on your desk or, or you throw it in your bag and, you know, you travel. You literally travel with it. So when you do, like, let's say let's say I have offices in New York and I'm in business in Chicago. I have my thing that I put in my bag. And when I get to my new office or I get to my new workspace, whatever it might be, I take I take I my, but it's cool. It, it does make your office feel. It's like, am I really going to hang up a family, you know, am I going to hang up my you know, decoration in this workspace? Or am I just going to throw my little clock there that makes me feel at home? I get it. I, I get it. Right? Sure, but it's a it's a six thousand dollar you know uh, uh, example. Hodinkee, I, I suppose, spared no expense. They went the most extreme way possible, mm. um, you know, and and they made I think ninety six of them. I I'm sure they'll all sell. I'm sure many of them were pre sold. Yeah, whatever. I think it's a silly way to spend money. I think it's a stupid thing. Um, the the movements were vintage, which is pretty cool. That's interesting. Um, I, I believe that, I believe that's the case. Uh, from were they from other? It was from a manufacturer. Like it was it was from a different manufacturer. I, I forget the. I'll, I'll pull it up. I mean, I have I have the link pulled up somewhere. I'm actually looking at alarm clocks on on the internet right now. <laughs>
The, the manufacture of the movements is called is called Pontifa, Pontifa, uh, founded in 1850. They made movements from dashboard clocks and, and pocket okay. watches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it is very cool. I mean, in, in that sense, I, I really do like it. And they're like vintage it. movements? Um, that's why, despite the vintage, yeah, it's a vintage movement. Yeah. Okay, like taken from dash clocks or whatever? I, I, they probably found like dead stock movements similar to Paddock has done that in the past. Okay. Um, so it's, it's it's cool. Like I, It's an interesting concept. Yeah. I, I like that you can take it and make something your own. But again, it seems it seems like like a just an attempt to get someone excited for a limited thing that's a little yeah, too I th- expensive. I think that the, po- the point of this is twofold. Um, well, well, people will think, oh, well, who's really going to buy this? Right? And that's right. And you, you, have to, you have to be a real special kind of guy to, to buy this $6,000, you know, desk clock. Um, and I, I actually don't even like the aesthetics of it that much. I think it's I think it's neither here nor there. It's lukewarm, so I spew it out of my mouth. It's a Bible quote. The point is, um, who, who's, people aren't going to buy this. There will be a, a, a handful of people that will buy it, 96 people will buy it, whatever. It's not a mass market piece. But what... What's valuable about this is not just the money that Hodinkee will make, right? Which is great. Which is valuable. Two, I'm sure it was fun for the team that did it. It's a creative exercise. It's a profitable creative exercise. Sure. That's great. And and which is which is when you're in a position like Hodinkee is, where you can do these creative, really crazy things that other people can't do, and you got to make money off of it. It's a fantastic opportunity. Yeah. But the big thing is, you will now have a list of 96 people that are mm-hmm. insane enough to do this, and that list equals something. Yeah. Right, that that's a it's a testament to your to your influence, and when you want to go sell ads, you use that. You know, this is this all has something to do with, or it's all it's all related, right? When, when Hodinkee wants to go sell their influence to whether that's Swatch or whatever it may be, when mm-hmm. they want to re, go to renegotiate a contract, they can say. We have proven again this year just how fucking insane our base is, how valuable we are. We know, we know a hundred people that would buy a, not we know, a hundred people would buy a $6,000 desk clock from us. That means that either, well, they're nuts and we found the nuts people, but also right. we have incredible influence. Exactly. So that's the point exactly. here. This isn't about a $6,000 you know, alarm clock. This is about consumer kind of research and, and uh, understanding your own influence. So it's unbelievable. Good for Odinky. Good for that. Stupid thing. Would never buy it. I wouldn't give you $1,000 for it. I find <laughs> it, would, it would be, I would buy in a second, I would buy a $1,000, $700, or $1,500 desk clock. A vintage JLC. Fantastic. Super cool. Sure. A little bit of wear and tear. It's Jaeger. You know what I mean? It's, it's just cooler in that way. Yeah. But the Hodinky one, I, I don't really care. Get real Tribeca. Um, another, yes. The watch we've been talking about for a while. Not, years. Not, not frequently. Something that comes up very mm. rarely. But um, but it has come up for the past couple of years. Yep. And, and the reason it's come up, one, it is popular in the industry. We'll talk about what it is in a second for those of you that don't know. And number two, um, uh, they're, they're so hard to find. They're, they're extremely difficult watches. So long story short, Gevrol is a, is a is a watch company, Swiss watch company, that um, that manufactured this limited edition run of 500 watches called the Tribeca in 1996, I believe. Yeah. And uh, and, and this watch it was an, an homage to the Rolex Paul Newman. They made, I think, five different examples or something like that, two in yellow gold and another three in steel, uh, different references, 6265, 6263, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what was shocking about them, two things. One, these homages were actually made before the Paul Newman was what it is today. Sure. It was still popular. It was still an expensive Rolex Daytona, but it wasn't the Paul Newman, like mm-hmm. as it is today, like this incredible $18 million cult item, number one. And number two, they're so accurate. Now... Uh, uh, some examples are a little bit more accurate than others, but all of these examples uh, are made super well. They're really impressive. Yep. Uh, the pushers and the bezels are actually interchangeable with real Paul Newmans. That's the level of that. attention that Gevrol paid uh, to you know the development of these watches. Right. So years ago, you could get them for like two thousand bucks. Now they're around five thousand um, bucks. I actually own one for myself, which is nuts. It's totally ridiculous uh, because I'm not a sports watch guy. I'm just not. I enjoy wearing this watch so much. I've, I've kept it for the last couple of weeks now, and I, I'm wearing it consistently. I'm, I'm wearing mm-hmm. it consistently, which is hysterical. I wear yeah. I wear little little watches all day, and then this isn't a big watch. It's 37 millimeters, um, but I just find it so shockingly beautiful, you know. And I'll I'll, I'll let you go here, uh, but th- it's difficult in all things, watches, all things, to separate your actual allure to something from the hype. Mm-hmm. Paul Newman's are just beautiful watches. There's tremendous hype around them, but they really are beautiful. Yeah, they're, they're distinctive. They're crazy cool, mm-hmm. um, and I think that the Gevrol kind of proves that. Uh, I'm just attracted to the, the design. I really am. Yeah, I think the Gevrol uh, was one of the first watches we sold one like, except three years ago maybe, right? 
I think that's oh, what yeah. we, we featured it in the middle. Yeah. And that was one of the first watches uh, that was traditional sport watch that yeah. I was comfortable wearing. Um, and and it, it's... What? No, no, I'm saying oh. the, the one that we sold in the shop three years ago is the same model that we have in the shop today. It was that black. It was the yes. black dial with the black acrylic. Same mm-hmm. model. Yeah, it's a beautiful watch. I yeah. think, And I think they're, they're very clearly homage. Like, you know... Some people could say it's a cop out or it's like cheap to, to steal well, the, the design. Yeah, but, there's no level of creativity there, right? But but I do think it's really. Uh, I think that you know, if purists are going to be purists, but I think that it's really fun to own something. So just great yeah. design and it feels great on the wrist, and it's a much lower price point. So you have the ability to own something that's comfortable, cool looking, and it's not ripping anyone off. And it's a conversation piece. Sure. You know, when you see someone wearing Gabriel Tribeca, you automatically know that oh, that's a watch geek. You know, let's talk about it. Even if you hate yeah, the watch, right, you can right. say hey. That's funny. That's a funny watch. Like, let's talk about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 they're limited to five hundred, like I said before. I and didn't know that. That's yeah. a very few. A very few. Yeah. And and it was you know it, it was a hot kind of potato for a while, and then John Mayer has one, and he posted his, and that's that was like the validation yeah. that watch needed to take off. Uh, but again, you know, five thousand bucks certainly is nothing to scoff at. It's certainly a lot of money. There's no question there. Um, but Relative. all things considered, you know, uh, there I think it's far more interesting, far more attractive, far more enjoyable mm-hmm. than most five thousand dollar watches out there. And I and I and I held owned sold watches that are you know, ten times, fifty, you know, twenty times the price that yeah. I've been like, okay, whatever. And you I know, forget the, but the I, dollar, the punch per dollar, I, I think it's off the charts. Yeah, and I forget the movement. Do you know? Is it like it's, it's a module? It's an auto. It's an, no, it's a, it's a modular automatic chronograph. Uh, okay. It's it's um a, 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 a Dupont, De Bras, something like that. You okay. put it on the screen. Uh, but it's a module automatic, so it is an automatic, not a manual, uh, which actually gives the watch a little bit more beef than the than the original Paul Newman. That's the biggest difference, really, mm. is that the that the cases are a little bit thicker because they're automatic, okay. which actually for a modern taste. Maybe even more attractive. Because it's 37. I think a lot of people might want that extra height. Extra height, yeah. So, I, again, I think it's fantastic. We have one available in the shop. If any questions about that, shoot me a message. Okay, two more things. Uh, one is a strap announcement. And then two, I want to talk to you about uh, the Grand Seiko video we released in the last couple of weeks. And, and not, not so much about the video on promoing. Yeah, it's a great video. We don't even need to promo it. Uh, but... Um, I want to talk about the process. You know, you're on the creative end, you know, and, and a lot of people obviously everyone sees the finished product, uh, which is which was great, did an amazing job. But I want to talk a little bit more and give people an insight into how it got done. You know what I mean? Uh, sure. But first, new straps. Uh, we, we, again, obviously a shop promo, but really a little bit more behind the scenes. I've wanted a single pass uh, leather strap for a while, like mm-hmm. for, for a really long time. Uh, and every time I went to go develop one with a different company, it was very, very difficult uh, for, for a lot of reasons. One, you know, cost-wise, totally prohibitive. And, and number two, um, because single passes need to be so thin, um, yeah. that's why they're usually synthetic. You know, mm-hmm. you can put a synthetic, okay. whatever. Uh, but when it comes to a leather, it's very, very difficult to actually make a, a thin and still strong and secure uh, single pass strap. It just is, mm-hmm. you know. So anyway, I went through, I think, four four different dummies, like four different rounds of of, uh, of editing. Um, one, the strap was too thick. Then one, you know, the, some of the holes were cracking. You know, problem, problem, problem. <laughs> Finally arrived on the straps that we have now in the one hair shop. We call it the Safiano Single Pass. Um, really fantastic. They're much more sporty than I'm used to. I'm not really a sports watch guy, um, but uh, you know, whether with a Datejust or with a Submariner or a GMT or putting Rolex aside with a host of other brands. These are really cool. They're really um, cool. Again, not something that you would think is my style, but I've been in love with the single pass look mm. for a long time. Um, and, and really, most of my watches I wear on single pass synthetic, like nylon and things. Yeah, right. Um, but with, with this leather one, it's very rich. It's very Hermes-ish. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a really big fan. I, I think that you like them as well. I do. And it's not my first like go-to. Initially, it was like, eh. I, I, I'm like very weird. But I like basically only like bracelets. But I was really surprised. They're really well made, um, and they yeah. feel. Um, I think a lot of not the problem, but but when you um, have a single pass NATO or you know Perlon, whatever yeah. it is, uh, whatever material, they kind of feel. Uh, to me, I would maybe be like nervous about putting my sub on it or like a heftier mm-hmm. watch, just because they they tend to feel Until slim, cheap. yeah, cheap. Um, but you know, just kind of like a little more dainty. Maybe that's the yeah. word. But these are substantial. Yep. Um, but they look great. Yeah, you know, and they, and they don't they don't bulk it up too much. I think that uh, the the and the leather is beautiful as well, but the way that their finish looks great and the thickness, I think it works really well. It's great. Uh, yeah. yeah, then they're handmade in El Paso, Texas. These are USA mm-hmm. straps. Uh, I've wanted to work on something with the United States, you know, manufacturer for a while. Yeah, and uh, I'm really you know glad to have uh, have done this. So the straps are available mm-hmm. in the Theo and Harris shop right now. We have two colors. We have more coming in exotic materials. Yeah. But right now we have black Saffiano and uh, and, and and like a butterscotch or camel whatever yeah. Saffiano. 
really beautiful stuff. Uh, they're 125 bucks, which is actually you know pretty significantly below our other straps. So I wanted to find a, a new price point. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I I love our JR straps. They are 100% the best straps in you know uh, among their competitors. Yes. This is just different. It's just a different thing. So let us know down in the comments what you think about these straps. Actually, I'll give two away um, to the yeah. best comment on this whole video. It's two best comments on this whole video. You get to pick brown or black. Uh, it'll look great on your watch. So again, comment down below. Best two comments. Win a strap each. Strap. How easy does it get? Just, com- just comment something interesting. Just you know, comment. and don't don't be boring. Don't be dull. I'm just kidding. I, 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 last subject, and this is on you, right? Obviously, I manage the shop, but but you really oversee and, and manage and execute all the content, mm-hmm. right? So so Grand Seiko, we produced a, a Grand Seiko video on their 60th anniversary called the Superman. Post COVID, you know, to talk just talk about the, the whole process. Yeah. So obviously, as you saw during COVID, everything basically stopped. Right? We couldn't go to yeah. London Jewelers anymore. Yeah. We had been. Uh, Working with Grand Seiko, couldn't couldn't go see them. I decided to put more videos out than we normally did to yep. just keep people engaged um, and offer content when people are home. Yep. So um, we made TNH super bingeable. Like oh yeah, we yeah. did. Yeah, quarantine awesome. age. Right. Quarantine uh, age. That was great, but it really limited what we were able to produce. Yep. And this Grand Seiko video is one of the first ones, if not the first one, uh, that we made yeah. that we got to go out of. It, my it was the first. Your kitchen. It was the first COVID like high quality video, and yes. and, and that's we both agree that that's our you know, mutual favorite part of running Theo and Harris is is being able to produce really interesting content, content that uh, is is not just enjoyable but like truly high quality. It's just more fun. You take pride in it. You know, I enjoy yeah. sourcing watches. I love watches. I love playing with them. But there's nothing. I, I don't take pride in selling a Submariner. Like it's yeah. it's anyone can do it. You know what I mean? Like anyone, exactly. As long as you just you buy a good watch and sell that, post it on Instagram. You know, you could sell a good watch. I don't. That, that, that's not where I derive my confidence. You know, right. uh, I love doing it. I enjoy it. But it's not where I derive my confidence. Whereas producing a great piece of content with you to me is such a fulfilling experience. Yeah. It's like wow, from beginning to end, that didn't exist. And now it does, yes. and it's and and I love really from an egotistic point of view looking at all the different you know companies, all the different you know ad companies like we are different sources and saying, wow, who produced the best piece of content on this particular launch? Yeah. Um, and on the Superman, it was us. I, I absolutely feel that way. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, so, and, and and led by you, so you did a fantastic job. Well, thank you. But I think for me, uh, what's what's really fun about those projects is that you and I get to uh, work together in a very different way than we get to work together on a day to day basis, mm-hmm. right? Like you provide a lot of different creative input than mm-hmm. I do, but I think we complement each other really well. So it was, we like still had, we're wearing masks when we went to go shoot in like a location we booked. Yeah. And it was still very like kind of, it's still in quarantine. So yep. it was very uh, limited, but it was really great to be able to go r- record the sunrise. We were there at 5 a.m. together. Yep. Like that was really fun. That was cool. Um, and, and yeah, these these videos are, are what make this worth it to well, me 100 percent yeah. and then that's at scale what we hope to be doing on a, on a con- very consistent basis i'd like to re- you know i'd like to make our content portfolio very heavy on those types of videos producing them multiple times a month you know yeah, two absolutely. or three types of those videos a month now producing those videos it, 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 it takes so long uh not just in the, the man hours but even in, in, oh, yeah. the, in the, the theory and the development of these creative things it's very difficult you yeah, know it's a, lot, it, of production. It's, it's a yeah. lot of production it's a lot of planning and it's mm-hmm. a lot of uh, uh storytelling you know and uh the, the way that you know, I, I you know, storytell uh, when it comes to these things, you know, writing the, the narrative. I work on developing the narrative at six o'clock in the morning, you know, mm-hmm. after a cup of coffee. I try it really at night when I'm tired. I try it in a good mood and a bad mood. I try it, you know, all these different things, a little you're drinking a little bit, you know. It reminds me of, um, of, of Stanley Crouch, who was, a, among other things, he was a jazz critic. Uh, and then, mm-hmm. you know, he was talking about Miles Davis and specifically it was a Bitches Brew album. And he said, uh, I tried it dead sober. I tried it a little high. I tried it very high. And the whole idea, and I don't, I don't do drugs, but, but the whole idea is, you know, attempting things that are creative or, or, or evaluating things that are creative, you, in my opinion, in Stanley Crouch's opinion as well, not that it makes it right or wrong, but in our mutual, you know, opinion, uh, it takes different emotions to, to, to do something that is kind of creative. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe if you're, uh, you know, a wunderkind at it, you don't have to do it. You just sit down and you just produce a beautiful thing. Yeah, but don't. for the rest of us, for the rest of us normal people, you know, to, to, to produce something that is actually you know, interesting and compelling actually takes a while. Yeah. Uh, and, and different, you know, not just takes a while, but takes a lot of different moods and energies and it takes, you know, time to review and you know, it's I, um, it's an interesting process. I agree. I think a big part of that though is like when we first said, okay, we have this watch, hmm. it, we, I think we had it for like 
maybe two weeks before we even started being able to really write the narrative around it because you have to it's about i think yeah. you know sitting with something you had the first idea okay this is about the start of something new it's 60 years is kind of like a rebirth yes. in japanese culture so yes. how do we represent that okay they said sunrise in the colors and then we sort of sat with that yep. for days yeah and then okay how can we how can we film in a way that shows that what's too much what's the right amount yep. how do we not go overboard like yeah so, how do you be, ta- so, how do you be tasteful it, yeah and that i think it's about sitting with it and processing and I think sometimes like you just kind of like you call me one day you're like let's just like oh my god sunrise we got it and that's kind of like it it sometimes just happens like you have to to process it enough to let those sort of moments like come to you and what's difficult about producing content like that content that's meaningful and interesting is you can only do it with products that are meaningful and interesting you know well it's very hard people do but it's very hard to make something that feels real without yeah if you know Grand Seiko is one of the manufacturers that puts the most thought into their product every almost everything about their watches is very well thought out yes so so to produce something with Grand Seiko is a little bit easier Uh, other manufacturers they're like oh no this is just it's just what it is. I don't know. You know, and they, they, there's yeah. no, there's nothing there of meaning. Uh, one of the really interesting things that I that I and this is um, in our next Grand Seiko video, which is about the GMT. Mm-hmm. One of the interesting things that I was learning about and, and reading about, and learning about was their collaboration through their co-creators program with yeah. uh, Kengo Kuma, I believe. Uh, he's a Japanese architect, um, and and he uh, was the architect to the Shizukuichi 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 Studio. Uh, and and what's interesting about that uh, is uh, he designed this. Studio, um, it, it's in it's in Mount by Mount Amate, Mount Amate Prefecture is the area, mm-hmm. and uh, he wanted the studio, all basically all windows to embrace nature, right? Mm-hmm. Because the Grand Seiko watches and their culture is so about nature. It's about kind of Japan, not just the culture, mm-hmm. but about like. What is the snow there? Like, what does the mountain look mm-hmm. like? You know, all these different beautiful things, the shadows, all these things. Yeah. Uh, so, so, and, and Grand Seiko drives it home consistently. Consist- the cherry blo- the do. cherry blossoms, the, you know, all these different things. Mm-hmm. What does summer look like in Japan? What does it smell like? You know, so I find that very interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, uh, we could, uh, I could, you almost can't even do a lot of their products justice because they're so well thought out. Yes. And, th- but that's one of the best things about working with them is that everything they do is done with the same thought. Yeah. And you can actually see yeah. all of the, visual representations mm-hmm. of what goes into their watches. Yeah. They have a pop-up currently, um, which is really cool. It's a very immersive yeah. experience, yeah. and they tend to do very fully immersive experiences when they say they're going to launch something or throw a party. Absolutely. Is, well, well, here's the video of when we went to, we went to uh, L.A. This is, their, yeah. this is their launch video for their Godzilla. Screw hors d'oeuvres. Keep the buttoned-up wait staff. Give me an experience. Teach me about the brand. Educate my emotional impression. All right, I think that was fantastic. We kind of did this on the whim. We were talking about this for like a week or two. Yeah. We should do this more often. What do you guys think? Again, uh, best comments down below. Uh, two best comments get 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 a strap each. So that's two straps that are being shipped out yeah. uh, basically tomorrow or something. Uh, what do you think about this video? What do you think about the Grand Seiko collaboration? Mm-hmm. What do you think about anything that we discussed today? We read them, we answer many of them, and we will pick winners. So comment mm-hmm. down below. So, and let us know if you want us to talk about anything else. Yes. On the next time we do this. Yes. And, and if we think you should do this more regularly, tell us that as well. Tell us everything you think about. Want to stop at the same time? What do you think? Yeah. One, let's two, three.